Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. And as always, we're glad you're with us. We're going to put our contact information up for you so you can know how to reach us. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden. And uh, Sunday's at 9 and 10. Thursday's at 7 p.m. is when you, we can study God's Word together. We hope you'll come out and visit with us any opportunity you can. We are. Uh, always uh, willing to study God's Word with you, and we want to remind you that you can get a free Bible correspondence course by writing or calling. Uh, you can even text me if you want to, and uh, give me your address, and we'll get the correspondence out to you, starting it, and then we will, you send it back in, we'll give you a graded, uh, a self-addressed stamped envelope, you send it back to us, we'll give you the next one, and uh, and so forth. So, at the end, you get a, a certificate of completion, and we'll be glad to Get that to you. Of course, it's free of charge, and we'll be uh, mailing it to you. You can take it to the privacy of your own home. If you have any questions about it, we'll be glad to answer those as well. So please uh, take advantage of the opportunities that you have to, to study God's Word free of charge. Most, most uh, places or most uh, people on TV are always trying to sell you something. They're wanting to sell you, uh, uh, I don't know, a prayer cloth for a love offering or a bottle of oil for a love offering or... Just send a seed, sow, uh, sow a seed or whatever, but we're trying to sow the seed and we want to give the seed to you. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, so we're trying to give you that seed and, and any way we can, we hope you will take advantage of that very thing. Tonight, friends, you've heard us talk often about miracles not being existent today, but you know, signs and wonders uh, have their place. They had their place in the first century. In the first century, they were miraculous events used to prove the message or the messenger was from God. And I'm just going to start off by saying, I'm going to tell you there are some signs and wonders today. And we're going to talk about that. But first, let's look what the Bible says about signs and wonders. John 4 and verse 48. John 4 and verse 48. <clears throat> trying to show you that the that they were used, these signs and wonders were used to convince people of the truth. John 4 verse 48, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now, there's a lot of people today that think that signs and wonders are still available today for this very purpose. They, they would say that signs and wonders are, are in existence so that people can prove that God is real or whatever, but the Bible clearly says that these signs and wonders were for a purpose and for a designated time. In Acts 5, verse 12, Acts 5 and verse 12, notice this, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the next verse says that <clears throat> the rest uh, uh, of the rest, there's no man to join himself to them. But the people magnified them, and the believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. <clears throat> so the signs and wonders had an effect on individuals to convince them of a message. Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. We'll give you one more verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, How shall we escape if we ne neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So here signs and wonders were used to confirm the message. And we know that they have ceased, that these miracles that were used to confirm the word have, have ceased. In Mark 16, verse 17 and 18, verse 17, Mark 16, Verse 17, I'll get it right in a minute. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? Shall they speak with new tongues? They shall take up uh, serpents. They, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heavens and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth. Now watch it. Here it is. They went forth, preached, and preached everywhere the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. So the signs that were listed there were used to confirm the word. Well, we have the confirmed word today. It is the Bible. This is the confirmed word of God. It's inspired word of God. It's all we need. 
for life and godliness, Peter says. But, so we know that miracles have ceased. The signs and wonders are no longer uh, present today. But are they? Well, let me just say this. I'll say that, that uh, we're going to talk about some modern day signs and wonders. Maybe not what you're thinking. Since we've just laid out what the Bible said about signs and wonders, you may be saying, well, James, how in the world are you saying that there's signs and wonders today when you just showed that the Bible clearly says that signs and wonders have ceased? Well, we're going to talk about modern day signs and wonders. And when I show you these signs and wonders, or when we talk about these signs and wonders, I want you to know that, it dem that these signs and wonders are going to demonstrate something, just like the ones uh, the Bible miracles of, of, uh, that we read about demonstrated something. These signs and wonders are going to demonstrate something too. And it's probably going to demonstrate something that you don't know or maybe that you have missed. And that's what we want to focus on today. So here's the signs and wonders we're talking about. Let's just start off with the first one. This sign. Now here's the sign that I'm talking about. Now we're not talking about miracles. I just want you to see that signs and wonders today are like this. Here's a sign from the Brosville United Methodist Church. Here's a sign that says Christmas Eve Communion, December 24th, Saturday, 4 p.m. Pastor Inteco. Now, this sign that talks about Christmas Eve Communion, December 24th on a Saturday at 4 p.m., this sign makes me wonder. Now, here's the signs and the wonders. That sign makes me wonder. When I see a sign like that, friends, it makes me wonder, do people know what the Bible says about communion? Do they realize that the Bible clearly says on the first day of the week? We're not even going to talk about Christmas right now, the fact that they're offering this communion at Christmas, but just the fact that someone says, well, we're going to have the, uh, the communion, we're going to have the Lord's Supper on Christmas Eve on Saturday. That really makes me wonder. It makes me wonder, have they even read the Bible? In Acts 20 and verse 7, Acts 20, Acts 20 and verse 7, notice what the Bible says. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and he continued speech until midnight. So here it is, on the first day of the week, the disciples came together for the purpose of breaking bread. That is, for the Lord's Supper. How do I know? Someone says, well, James, that's a, that, that's a, a term to use for a, a, a common meal. No, because notice this. In Acts, uh, Acts 20, come on down, uh, they were in the upper room, and here Eutychus falls asleep. Paul was so long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell out of the window. Now notice, he went down. Paul says, trouble not yourself. He's not dead. Raise him up. Uh, and when he had come again, he had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while. Now, why are they having a common meal and then they're having a common meal again? They came together for a common meal and then Paul eats. What, Paul eating the leftovers? No, the disciples came together for the Lord's Supper to break bread. That is the Lord's Supper, the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And so it happens on the first day of the week. That's the example that we have. So when I see a sign like this, it really makes me wonder how much attention people are paying to the Bible. How much attention are they paying to the, to the verse that says the disciples came together upon the first day of the week? I wonder. It makes me wonder. Because so many people today are not even partaking of the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week. They're not concerned about the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a lady just the other day, door knocking, <clears throat> She said that they, that the, the disciples of Christ there in Eden had uh, uh, split from the Presbyterian church. Now, I don't know if she's talking about historically or just locally. Historically, I think she got her history wrong, but, but if it's locally, it doesn't really matter. She said they split from the Presbyterian church because the Presbyterians don't take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And the disciples of Christ, the Christian church, the disciples of Christ, do. She said, so we, 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 we can't do that. You know, we take the, the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, which is, that's what the Bible says. Now, and she said, we're the, only, we're the only disciples of Christ in town. And I said, well, here's the disciples of Christ right up here on the boulevard. The Shaw, S-H-A-W, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. 
uh, right up on the boulevard, right up on the end of the boulevard. You drive by, and there's a big bench out there that says S-H-A-W. I thought that stood for sit here and wait. But they're the disciples of Christ. She said, oh, yeah. She said, well, we, we, we uh, uh, do things with them, too. We have joint services with them. And I said, wait a minute. I said, they meet on Saturdays. And she said, well, that's okay. Now, they split from the Presbyterians because the Presbyterians didn't take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. But they will fellowship another Disciples of Christ group that meets on Saturday night and partakes of the Lord's Supper. So here's another group that they will fellowship who's not partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week either. Now, at least the Presbyterians, when they did take the Lord's Supper, they took it on the right day. But they're going back and forth with someone who, who doesn't uh, partake of the Lord's Supper at all. Well, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder if anybody has ever paid attention to what the Bible says at all. And why does it even make a difference if you'll fellowship one group that doesn't even meet on the first day of the week, that doesn't partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Why does it matter if another group does or not? See? The, but the signs like this all make me wonder. Is anybody paying attention? Now, here's another one. Talking about, talking about uh, uh, Christmas communion, you know, I mean, I guess when you get right down to it, if you're going to do something wrong like celebrating Christmas, which is not Jesus' birthday, you know, you celebrate Jesus, Christmas as Jesus' birthday, that's not in the Bible. But if the, if the, the, the uh, uh, Methodist church the Brussels, uh United Methodist Church, if they're going to celebrate Christ's birthday, Christmas Eve, Christ's birthday, and they want to have communion, I guess it doesn't really matter what you do to celebrate it. You might as well go all the way and do it wrong, right? I mean, isn't Christmas as Jesus' birthday, isn't that about his birth? Whereas the Lord's Supper, communion is about his death? So, but like I said, I mean, if you're going to get it wrong, you might as well just go all the way and just, I don't know, what difference does it make really, I guess. Now, here's another one. Here's another sign. So that's a sign that makes me wonder. But here's another sign talking about communion on December 24th. Here's another sign. This sign. This sign makes me wonder too. Now, this is the Westover Baptist Church. They're in Danville. And it had the sign outside that said, Floating Communion December 24th. 4 to 6 p.m. <clears throat> now that sign really got me wondering. This sign really makes me wonder what in the world is floating communion? I'm seriously wondering what is floating communion? I googled floating communion. I didn't find anything definitive that I could find. I had to google it because I couldn't bible it. I couldn't look it up in the Bible, floating communion, what in the world? I mean, I, I, what, what is that? Everybody's going down the river on the inner tube, taking the communion. Is that floating communion? I, I don't know what that is. Floating communion? I mean, you got, you got the, the, the bread and, the, and the, uh, the fruit of the vine. You got it floating in the big tub or something. I, mean, I don't know. Is that, is that like bobbing for apples or something? We're, we're, we're bobbing for the bread and bobbing for the blood. What? I don't understand what is that? Floating communion. A floating communion service on December the 24th from 4 to 6 p.m.? Boy, that sign got me scratching my head for sure. What in the world could that mean? Now, I think, and somebody could call in and tell me, straighten me out on this because I can't find the Bible, but I think it means you come and go whenever you want to. From 4 to 6, you come and, you, I don't know, you may say a prayer or do whatever, sing a song, and then take, the, take a communion and, you're out of here. You know, it's kind of like not quite drive-through communion, but it's just, you know, kind of a come, come and go situation. I don't know. I guess like a, some kind of a party or something. Very, very reverent, I might say. I'm saying it tongue-in-cheek. Now, I think that's what it means. But again, that sign has really got me wondering. I mean, it's got Stevie wondering. Here, what does that mean, a floating communion? Everybody kind of comes and goes at some point in time between 4 and 6 p.m.? Now, we've already talked about the fact that they're having the Lord's Supper on a day that I guess they would normally celebrate as Jesus' birthday. I don't, I don't get it. 
But <clears throat> here you have another blatant disregard or just don't care about what the Bible says. This sign has really got me wondering. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, listen to what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 18. <clears throat> Paul is, is condemning the Christians in Corinth. He, he's got a lot, they got a lot of problems going on. And one of them <clears throat> has to do with the worship, excuse me. He says, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear there be division among you, and I partly believe it. So notice, they're coming together, was what he said. They came together, and he said, verse 19, for there must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, it was supposed to be to eat the Lord's Supper. They were supposed to come together in one place to eat the Lord's Supper, but they had abused it and misused it to, so, to such a degree that it was no longer the Lord's Supper. They had changed it to something else. What did they change it to? Well, they changed it to a common meal. He says, for in eating, everyone taketh uh, before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So he said, what you've done, you've made it a big common meal, Someone's taking, uh, eating all their food and somebody over here hadn't brought anything so they're hungry. And he says, what? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? I praise you. Uh, shall I praise you in this? I praise uh, you not. He said, I'm not, I'm not patting you on the back for doing this at all. It's, it, you've, you've corrupted the Lord's Supper. Not to mention the fact that you're Actually, not even treating your fellow, uh, um, your fellow brother in Christ with any regard. Not only are you abusing the Lord's Supper, but you don't even treat your, your brother with any kind of respect by giving him something to eat. He says now in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After this manner, after the same manner, he took also the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink, <clears throat> this do ye as often as ye drink it. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, here is what Paul says you're supposed to be doing. You should all be coming together, partaking of the Lord's Supper to remember his death and his, his resurrection, looking forward to his return. And he says you ought to be coming together to do this. And then notice, let's come on down to verse 33. He says, uh, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. When you come together to eat the Lord's Supper, you wait for one another. Now, please someone tell me, how in the world can the folks at Westover Baptist Church, number one, say they're having the Lord's Supper, which on this case was on a Saturday night, all right? There's one thing that's wrong, wasn't on the first day of the week. Then they're having a floating communion where people can come and go and just as they, you know, I guess you're out doing your Christmas shopping or, you know, you've been opening presents and now, well, let's run on down there to the Westover Baptist Church and let's take communion, you know, take a chip and take a sip and then, we're, then we'll take our Christmas trip. Uh, is, is that what we're talking about? It wasn't on the first day of the week and it certainly wasn't when they all came together in one place. Paul said you all come together in one place on the first day of the week and you tarry one for another. Now in the church of Christ, that is exactly what we do. We have a set time. Here's the time when we're all going to assemble together and it's at this time that we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, different congregation may be in different places, may be at a different time, but the individuals who assemble with this congregation know that at a certain time, this is when we're going to be assembled together in the church in one place on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. In Eden, we have our worship at 10 a.m. 
And all the brethren that assemble with us know this is, hey, this is when we're going to have the Lord's Supper. We're not going to do it on Saturday night. We're not going to do it on Sunday at 3. We're not going to do it on Friday night at 5. We're not doing it Thursday at noon. We're not doing Wednesday at, at 10 a.m. We're not doing it Tuesday at 9 p.m. We're doing it Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It's when we assemble together for worship. We all come together in one place and we sing, we pray, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we hear uh, preaching, we study God's Word, and we, and we lay by store upon the first day of the week. But the Lord's Supper is when we assemble together and we know that everybody is going to be there who is concerned about partaking the Lord's Supper. It's not a floating thing. Come, you know, well, we're going to leave, we're going to leave the, the communion out and anybody that wants to come through later on can kind of dabble here and dabble there, I guess. Come on in and take a sip and take a chip and go on the way. See, these signs make me wonder. Do people really care about the Bible? I mean, they, we just put some, hey, that sounds good. Somebody else in the world's doing it. It sounds convenient. Everybody's having their own families, family together. We'll just set up a time. We'll just do it our way. We don't really, really care about what God says. Well, that sign makes me wonder. Signs like that make me wonder. Signs and wonders. Now, here's another sign that makes me wonder. This is right down the street from where we assemble. This is, this is the Eden Baptist Church. And Mr. Darrell Law, he, he, won't, uh, he won't talk to you. He won't answer questions. We've gone in there uh, on occasions and asked him if we're having Bible study on Wednesday night. Well, we might have it tonight and we might not. What about next week? Well, we might have it, we might not. That was his way of saying we don't want you to come back. And they got stickers all up. No, no audio or video recordings allowed on the premises. So any of you folks at Eden Baptist Church that have phones and so forth, you, you're disobeying the, your own signs right there. Nonetheless, I digress. But here's the sign that they have up right now. <clears throat> it says, we welcome our three new members, the Lord added to EBC. Now, friends, that sign really got me wondering. It's really got me wondering what, it makes me wonder what Bible have they been reading? It makes me wonder, have they even read about the church? Have they even read about the Lord uh, adding people to the church? Notice, in Acts 2 and verse 42, the Bible talks about people being added to the church, no, no doubt about it. I'm sure I'm Acts 2.47. I had the wrong verse up there. <clears throat> Acts 2 verse 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now friends, think about that. I'm wondering. The sign says the Lord added to the Eden Baptist Church. But Acts 2 says, Acts 2 verse 47 says, the Lord added to the church. Now, there wasn't a Baptist church in the first century. There's not a Baptist church in the Bible. So I know, I know that the Lord didn't add the people in Acts 2 to the Baptist church. Here's how I know that. One reason is because the people in Acts 2 had been baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then when, you, when he gives them some more exhortation with many other words that he exhorts saying, Save yourselves from this unto what generation, they that gladly received his word, verse 41, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. How were they added? By being baptized, repenting and being baptized for the remission of sins is how they were added unto them. Who added unto these folks? Who added, unto the, who added to the folks in Acts 2 verse 41? Well, we get the answer to that in verse 47. And the Lord added unto the church. The Lord added unto them daily such as should be saved. How were they saved? Repenting and being baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They that gladly heard that message and obeyed it were baptized and they were added unto them. Who did the adding? The Lord added to them. See how easy it is? 
So when you're looking in the in the first century, you're finding, look, people in the New Testament were added to the church by God after they had been baptized for the remission of sins. Now, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Is that is that how folks were added to the Eden Baptist Church? See? In Acts, in Acts 2, in Acts 2, the baptism for the remission of sins was also the means by which they were added to the church. How do I know that? Well, we just read Acts 2, 38, Acts 2, 41, and Acts 2, verse 47. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then verse 47 says, who did the adding? Now, if they had been baptized for the remission of sins and were added to the church, the Lord added them to the church. Now, I know that couldn't have been the, the Eden Baptist Church. I know that couldn't have been the Jerusalem Baptist Church. You know why? Because the Lord adds to one kind of church. It is the church of Christ. It's called the church of Christ because it belongs to Christ. It is his body. In Galatians 3, in verse 27, Galatians 3, verse 27, notice this. Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, when you're baptized into Christ, what are you baptized into? If you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his body, which is the church. He's the head of the body, the church. Now, friends, when I see a sign that says the Lord added to the EBC, it really makes me wonder, have they even read their Bible? Do they even know what the Bible says about Add about the Lord adding to the church. Which church did the Lord add to? Have they even paid attention to what the church is as the body of Christ? Now the three people that were added to the body of Christ, or excuse me, the three people that were added to the Eden Baptist Church, what did they do? Were they baptized for the mission of sins? Oh, you know better than that. You know, you know that nobody in the Baptist church was ever baptized for the remission of sins. As a matter of fact, the Baptist manuals, and probably your Baptist preacher will tell you, that you don't even have to be baptized to get to heaven. But you do have to be baptized to be a member of the Baptist church. So if they were baptized into the Baptist church, but not baptized for the remission of sins, is it possible for them then to have been added by the Lord to the Eden Baptist Church? No. The Lord only adds to one kind of church, the church that Jesus died for, and that's not the Eden Baptist Church. It's not the Baptist Church at all, of any kind. Now, in the Bible, like we said in the Bible, people were added to the church that Jesus died for. Right? Now, I wonder, I wonder if, if people in the Bible were added to the church he has died for, I wonder where is the Baptist church even mentioned in this, if it's the same. Someone said, well, church don't matter. Oh, really? If church doesn't matter, then why, why do you even worry about calling yourself the Eden Baptist church? Why do you even put, put the Baptist up there? If it doesn't matter, why even make the distinction? Just If it doesn't matter, just call yourself the Mormon church. Oh, no, 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 no. Can't do that. Now, it ought to make you wonder, why would someone put on a marquee sign the Lord added to the Eden Baptist church why would they put this up here? 
if the Baptist church, the Eden Baptist church, or any other kind of Baptist church, if it's not in the Bible, why would they put this up here? You want me to tell you why? Because they want you to believe that the Baptist church is in the Bible. So we, we make it sound like God added to the EBC. Friends, the Lord is not going to add to the Eden, Eden Baptist church. The only thing the Lord is going to add to the e Eden Baptist church is woes. The only thing he's going to add to the, to the Eden Baptist church are the plagues that are come on those individuals who add to his word. You know why? Because you have to add something to the Bible to get to Eden Baptist church. You have to add something to the Bible to get to Baptist church. The Lord's not going to add you to the Baptist church. When he's not even in the Bible. You're on the word from the Lord. Hello? You're on you're on the air. You're on the word from the Lord. Hello? Going once, twice. All right. <clears throat> now, this this is why this sign makes me wonder. This sign makes me wonder. Now, let's let me show you something else while we're on the Eden Baptist Church. Here's another sign that makes me wonder. Oh, we'll try it again. You on the word from the Lord? Yeah. You're, you're, on, the, you're on the word from the Lord? Uh, yes, I'm watching the program, and y'all know what y'all talking about. Bye. Okay. <clears throat> Boy, that was riveting. Let's, let's ponder that for a minute. Okay, here's a sign. I like when people go, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Well, why don't you educate us then, sir? Educate me a little bit. Call back in and let's, let's impart your wisdom here. All right, this sign. This is the cornerstone, I guess, or the, I, I don't know, uh, I call it a cornerstone, at the Eden Baptist Church. And I want to enlarge this for you, what it says here at the bottom. It says the Eden Baptist Church, uh, let's see, Eden Baptist Church organized November 29th, 1986, ded dedicated the building 1988. Then it says, lifting up Christ as Savior of the world. John 12, 32. Now, friends, that sounds pretty good. I mean, hey, I got a scripture up here on the, on the sign and, you know, engraving in stone and, you know, it's, Dedicated with the scriptures. God, boy, that's, that's got to be, that's powerful. Friends, this sign makes me wonder, again, do people even read scriptures? Do they read the context of scriptures before they, you know, before they engrave them? Before they put them in stone? Do they even read scriptures before they, you know, I've seen people sign you know, sign verses at the end of a, a letter or something. It's like, have you even read that? Do you even really know the context of what is being said here? But when I see a sign that says we're lifting up Jesus as Savior of the world and then put John 12, 32, it makes me wonder, have they even read John 12, 32? Let's look at it. John 12, verse 32. John 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, keep reading. That sounds pretty good, right? Oh, we want all people to come to Jesus. But read verse 33. This he said, <clears throat> signifying what death he should die. If I be lifted up from the earth, in other words, if I die, if I crucify, I'm going to draw all men unto me. Now, it makes me wonder. If someone says we're going to lift up Christ in order to draw all men to him, you're saying you want to crucify Jesus again. Now, you think about that. If they want to draw all men to Christ, you don't do it by crucifying Christ. That, but that's exactly what lifting up Christ means. Just do a concordance. Do a, do a word search. 
Find lifting up Christ. Lift it up. It's talking about being crucified. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I don't want to lift up Christ. Like John 12, 32 says. The way I'm going to exalt Christ is I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to exalt his word. I'm going to proclaim his word. I'm going to magnify his word. I'm not going to lift him up. John 12, 32. Put him on the cross again. Here's what you, look. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw them in unto me. Now, if you want to draw people to Christ, draw people to the Lord, the way to do that is not by crucifying, but by <clears throat> teaching the gospel. Look at John 6. John 6 and verse 44. No man can come to me <clears throat> except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, most people stop right there. They usually read this verse and they stop right there. Yeah. No man come to God except the Father draw, come to Jesus except God draw him. God has to draw you. Well, friends, how, do you, how, how does God draw people? How does God draw people to Christ? Is it by crucifying Jesus? Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. If you want to be drawn to Christ, you don't lift up Christ and crucify him again. You teach about the gospel. But you know what? You will never hear <clears throat> from, you will never hear of, you will never learn anything about God from the Baptist church. You won't hear God say anything about the Baptist church. So I know this. If I'm telling someone or if someone tells me, yeah, the Lord added to the Baptist church, you know what it tells me? That's not getting me anywhere close to God. Now, friends, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make you wonder. <clears throat> Why is it that so many people would have you believe that you can be drawn closer to God in a church that God never even talked about? If God tells you how to get close to Him, if Christ says, if you're taught and you learn of, of God, you come to Him, why wouldn't He say and learn about the Baptist church while you're at it? Because if you learn about the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church or the Christian church or the Lutheran church or the Pentecostal Holiness church, why wouldn't he say learn about those churches and come close to me? See, I, I'm, I'm trying to make you wonder. Those signs, when you see these signs, it ought to make you wonder. Where are these people getting their information that they put on these signs? You want to word from the Lord? Hey, James. Hey, Mark. Uh the drive-by caller a while ago, you know, just spouted out, y'all don't know what you're talking about, but as far as I can see, you've given scripture for everything that you're stating. And so in actuality, he's just telling God flat out, you don't know what you're talking about. Right. <clears throat> you know, in our, in our class on Thursday night, Mark, we're talking about the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man in 1 Corinthians. Right. And it's, it's amazing, you know, the more you, you look at it and the more you see Really, when it gets right down to it, everything, every time people, even people that claim to follow the Bible, when they reject what God says, they're saying we're smarter than God. That's Just right. because it doesn't make sense to you or to me doesn't mean it's not right. doesn't mean it's not God's uh, will, you know. But what is revealed in his word, we know is his will. So I'm not going to be smarter than God and say I'm going to come close to him in a church he never talked about. That's right. And he even says himself to Isaiah, your ways are not my ways. Exactly right. His ways are higher. As far as I can see, you've given scripture for everything you've been presenting. So for somebody to say you don't know what you're talking about, they just blatantly said, God, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. That's on them, James. That's all I can say. Well, that's right. Good program. All right. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I just want to say thanks to Mark. Some of these pictures Mark, Mark gave me. So, uh, Appreciate that. All right, so so friends, yeah, when someone says let's lift up Christ, 
Uh-uh, that, that should make you wonder. That ought to be a sign that makes you wonder. <clears throat> well, let's look at one more. This sign, signs and wonders, this sign, this sign, united in Christ ministry. This is, this is right there in Eden. Is the old, uh, used to be the old Christian church, uh, I believe. Maybe the old Disciples of Christ church, I don't know. Uh, anyway, here's their marquee. God's love is unconditional, unlimited, and complete. Now, I'm not really having a problem with, with so much as God's love is complete and it's unlimited. I mean, it's, I mean, God is love. But to say, just stop right there. When God's love is unconditional, now I guess by definition, if you can prove God's love is conditional, then in some ways it is limited in the sense of it's, you know, he, he's going to stop uh, shedding forth his love. He said, I love them that love me and hate them that hate me. But just stop with the word unconditional. God's love is unconditional. That ought to make you scratch your head and go, whoa, 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 whoa stop, whoa, stop, what? That sign makes me wonder. Do you know what unconditional means? Do you really know what unconditional means? That means there's no conditions on it. No exceptions, no qualifications, no prerequisites, right? No stipulations, no loopholes, whatever. I mean, that, it's unconditional. There was a country song a few years back, I think George Strait sang it. You know, he says, let me tell you the secret about a father's love. Secret that my daddy said was just between us. Daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. And in the end of the song, he says, I died and went to heaven and God let me on in because God's love was without end. Well, friends, that, that's, a, that's a nice, touching, warm song. But you know what? It's not Bible. God's love is conditional. I mean, and when you look through the Bible, I mean, how many ways can you miss the fact that God's love is Conditional not unconditional. I'm mean, just, look for example, in Matthew 18 and verse 3. Matthew 18 and verse 3. At the same time, let's, let's start with verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and said, uh, set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now let's stop right there. Accept, not accept, not A-C-C-E-P-T. That means to, to take it. But accept, that means <clears throat> if not or unless. There's the exception to the rule. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Sounds to me like there is a condition on God's love. God loves people, but yet he's not going to let them into the kingdom. He loves people, but he's not going to let them into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what kind of what kind of God is it that says, I love everybody unconditionally, but you're not going to get into heaven? Well, an unconditional love wouldn't have a stipulation like this on it. Except you become like a little child. Except you be converted. There, that sounds to me like like there's an exception to the rule. Let's look at this. Look. In, uh, let's look at another one. In John 8, 24. Now, if you want to say that God's love is unconditional, friends, you're going to have a problem with a lot of people, the majority, really the majority of people, I'm going to say in the religious world. Now, some of them, you know, they, they don't follow their doctrines to their own conclusions. But listen to this. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, is God going to love someone that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is God? Look, he says, if you believe not that I am, if you believe not that I am, God is I am. Jesus is deity. 
If you do not believe that Jesus is God, that he is the Son of God, if you do not believe that he is deity, you will die in your sins. But God loves you. Really? Son, I, I think this would be a, a condition on God's love. God's love loves you so much that he's going to save you from your sins, but you can die in your sins. Friends, if God's love is unconditional, he would never let you die in your sins. Now, the reason I say people, you know, they don't think about what they believe. Some people wind up saying, well, yeah, God's love is so unconditional that no one's going to be lost. And they would have you believe in universalism then. Listen, friends, if, it's, if God's love is unconditional, we, we just stop. If God's love is unconditional, then why even do anything? If God's love is unconditional, then you can rape, pillage, and plunder. You can rob, steal, and kill. Right? You can commit murder and mayhem. Right? You can do anything that's illegal, immoral, and fattening. And God's going to, man, he's, he, God loves you. But God's love is conditional. God's love puts some stipulations. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe not, you'll die in your sins. Now, if you believe that God's love is unconditional, then you must believe that you don't have to believe in God. You must teach that you don't believe in God. Is that the case? I wish somebody from the uh, <clears throat> United in Christ Ministries would, would call in and get some clarification. Do you believe in God's unconditional love? Because if you say, well, you can, you can still be loved by God even though you don't believe in the Son, well, that, well, surely then you don't have to repent. But again, Jesus puts an exception on there. In Luke 13, Luke 13, verse 3, look what he says. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Except ye repent, you shall likewise perish. Now, verse 5, he says it again. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. If you don't repent, you are going to perish. But God's going to love you. God's going to love you right to hell. The Bible says that God has no pleasure when the wicked die. I'm paraphrasing. God has no pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. But if God's love is unconditional, he has to love the wicked when they perish. Actually, if God's love is unconditional, people wouldn't be wicked. The wicked wouldn't perish at all. See what I'm talking about, friends? You see these signs, and oh, it sounds nice and pithy, right? It sounds like a good little, little, little quote there. It's going to stick in my head and I, as I'm driving by, and it's going, whoa, God's love is unconditional. Boy, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm praising God as I go down the road. And never stop to think, wait a minute. That's not in the Bible. Wait a minute, that's not scriptural. Wait a minute, that's not telling the truth here. If it told the truth, people get mad about it. But to say that God's love is unconditional, then you must say that you don't have to repent. But Paul says in Acts 17, in verse 30, he says that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. I guess if God's love is unconditional, then if you don't obey the command to repent, God's going to love you. You think God loves people who are disobedient to him? Is that, is that, doesn't that make you wonder? Do you now wonder if they believe that God loves individuals who won't repent, who won't confess Christ, who won't even believe in Christ? You think, Wait a minute. If God's love is unconditional, then, hey, I don't have to be baptized. Right? If, if, if God's love is unconditional, then, hey, baptism doesn't matter. Well, neither does repentance. Neither does confession of Christ. Neither does believing in Christ. But look in John 3 and verse 3. Uh, John 3 and verse 3. Here you've got Nicodemus coming to Jesus. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Uh oh. Why did you say, well, God's unconditional love, and so whether you're born again or not, you can enter to the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, Nicodemus said unto him, get back over here. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus clarifies. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever Jesus said in verse 3, be born again, he clarifies in verse 5, except a man be born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus asks him, How can I enter the second time in my mother's womb? Jesus is telling him, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say anything about being born again of your mother's womb. I said, except be born again. And when I say be born again, I mean being born of the water and the spirit. I'm not talking about being born of your mother's womb. I'm talking about being born of the water and the spirit. The spirit's words give the commands that you obey. And the spirit says, be baptized for the remission of sins in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is talking about baptism. Father, Mr. Sins. And Nicodemus didn't understand that. But regardless of what you think that means, regardless of what you think that means, if you think that God's love is unconditional, you have to then believe, and, uh, uh, believe that it doesn't really matter. What difference does it make? If you believe God's love is unconditional, then, hey, you, you don't have to... You don't have to uh, uh, even be faithful to the Lord. Look what Jesus said. He gives a condition here. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Only I don't know what I'm talking about because God's love is unconditional, so really if you abide in me or you don't abide in me, it doesn't really matter. Jesus says in verse 5, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye cannot, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified. Listen. Jesus says, here's the exception. Here's the condition. You have to abide in Christ. How do you abide in Christ? His words abide in you. So if you're abiding in Christ, His words are abiding in you, then, see, then God's love is going to be manifested unto you. But to say God's love is unconditional, then that means you don't, have to do anything really. Now, here's my point, friends, in all this. These are just a few of the signs that make us wonder. These signs ought to make you wonder. <clears throat> and if any of these churches care about what the Bible really says, you know, they'd be they'd be more careful about what they put on the sign. But it makes me wonder, do they really care at all? They just put something up there. They get go to the, I don't know, the almanac or something, pull out some little pithy little saying, you know, go to the joke book, put a joke out there and sounds good and put it on the sign. doesn't matter if it's teaching the truth or not. So these signs all make me wonder. And friends, there's, there's plenty more signs. These are just some modern day signs that really make me wonder. And I hope they make you wonder. I hope they make you wonder, you know, what else are these churches missing? What else is the Bible saying that these churches don't have a clue about? You know, like the man called up and said, don't know what I'm talking about? Listen, I'm not putting stuff on, on, on the sign that is contrary to the Bible. That ought to make you wonder, man, if... If, especially if you're a member of some of those churches we show tonight. You ought to be going, 
wait a minute. What am I being fed? What am I being taught? What am I being told? If they can't even get the sign, the marquee sign right, how do I know they're getting the sermon right? They missed it on the sign. You know they probably missed it in the sermon. If they can't get the little things right, what are they missing in the big things? But friends, we're here to help you. We're here to help you. <clears throat> and we want you to know that we care enough about you to tell you the truth. We care enough about you to, to help you see the truth. Here's how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653. If you want a free Bible correspondence course, let me know. Now, we're going to, from time to time, I think we're probably going to be doing some more signs and wonders. Uh, pretty good way to teach, I believe. So it may be that you're out driving around and you see a sign that makes you wonder. Hey, take a picture of it. Take a good, clear picture of it. You can send it to me. Word from the Lord at gmail.com. <clears throat> Or text it to me, 276-340-2653. We may do another segment of signs and wonders uh, that you see as you're out and about. Send them on in. Friends, if you'd like a free Bible correspondence course, you want to come visit with us and study God's Word uh, Sundays at 9 and 10 or Thursdays at 7, or if you'd like a Bible study, wordmelord.gmail.com, give me a call. I'll be glad to do that. Come out and help you uh, study God's Word <clears throat> so that you don't have to wonder about what the Bible is saying. Friends, thanks for watching. Always remember to make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.